All right, let me start by saying thank you, Peace Doc. And I'm also speaking from Lenape land, as Brittany uh, was. This week is certainly a brutal reminder that we are in a country built on racism and genocide. Now, 99 hours to a new administration. Will we get there? What does it mean? And what's our role in a sharply changed environment? The events of the past days are certainly a wake up call because it really exposes the complete inability of the police to confront an organized fascist forces. Armed fascist mob and the many thousands publicly gathered invaded Congress. It was not spontaneous. It was publicly planned and announced. These fascists are the greatest threat, not just to Congress, they are a threat to the working class as a whole, and especially and always to the most oppressed, to workers of color, to migrant workers, the LGBTQ movement, especially trans people. The fascists were mobilized, they were organized to disenfranchise black voters. And it's the black votes, the votes of people of color, that those were the votes that they wanted thrown out declared fraudulent in state after state. This is an old Klan tactic. We have to be clear on this. These armed white supremacists, as they stormed the US Capitol last week, they were wearing Auschwitz shirts, flying Confederate flags, US flags, Trump flags, and carrying zip tie handcuffs. They erected a gallows, planted pipe bombs in DC, and openly called for kidnapping lawmakers. These forces want to crush every meager gain of civil rights, social justice, the Black Lives Movement. Now, there may be different views on this, on whether the police, the state, all the repressive arms, its many surveillance agencies, including the FBI, were they all unable or were they totally inept? Or were they openly in collusion with the fascist forces? Regardless of how you view it, it's clear that the police offer no protection. Against fascist forces, they work with the fascists and the fascists thoroughly infiltrate all the police forces. They work consciously against mass workers movements. It's what they're set up to do. And what's the responsibility of the corporate media, especially social media? For years, there was a promoting and a pumping of Trump on Twitter, free reign on Facebook. Big money promoted Trump's racist tweets for years. So the January 6th events in DC were shocking, but not surprising. It's all we, we've seen the lines of armored police, National Guard, state police, heavy vehicles, helicopters, drones, surveillance, mass arrests against black lives, massive demonstrations this summer. Against really, what were the demonstrations? They were against what were routine police lynchings. It's no different than Klan lynchings of a hundred years ago. And there's no other word for the police terror that kills a thousand people a year, every year in the US. So really we can't allow these fascist forces to drag us down. I, I truly believe that the lesson is the only force that can confront, that can challenge fascist forces is mass workers movements, such as we saw this summer in the streets movements movements that push back racist police and right-wing forces across the country. These were explosive movements, the largest in decades and decades. Now, a lot of people in order for Biden to win, urged a shutdown of the in the streets movement, a move to the center, put all the energy into the ballot box. But really mass struggle is the only force that can defeat fascism and racist forces. This is historically true in the US and around the world. 
we could draw so many experiences and come back to it again and again of the past year and the huge demonstrations and then the fascist mobilizations and the election and then January 6th. But I wanna talk also about Charlottesville three years ago. I was there also in this demonstration. There was no police mobilized to stop the fascists in Charlottesville. They were all on standby, stand down as they were at the Capitol. People were encouraged to ignore the fascist threat to take over the city. But there was an organized fight back of workers and oppressed youth in the thousands that turned out to confront them. And their torchlight parades and statue protection that organized force, that force of youth sent the fascists into complete disarray. And the all powerful fascists started fighting each other and bickering and got demoralized and divided and left town divided. So I raise this to say that the police and the state cannot and will not ever protect our movement. Fascists have come out in DC in a stronger confrontation, but it's because the only force against them was now a carpet of National Guard to lock down DC. We have to go back to, I think, the youth chant, we keep us safe in order to push back fascist movements. And the way to do that, in my opinion, is to make demands, demands against racist police, against evictions, foreclosures, defaults, for emergency relief, for free health care for all, to end endless war. It's time to build unity and resistance. We need to build a strong, militant, united, workers-centered movement. If we don't demand it, we won't get it. Now, there's another lesson of the past days. And just to, to raise that, because I think it's so important as we talk about how to go from here, we have to recognize that US wars do come home that the years of US coup attempts around the world, each one of them claimed that they were responding to an election fraud. There's a caustic line that actually went viral globally within 24 hours. You've probably all heard it by now. Uh, and it was that due to COVID travel restrictions this year, the US had to organize a coup at home. This is a viral, you could say joke, that spread faster than a virus because it's so true. It's so understood around the world that this is a US tactic of choice. In Ukraine, in Venezuela, in Syria, in Libya, in Bolivia, Honduras, just to raise a few of the so many examples. Trump was just using a well-established playbook, create a fascist force, call it constitutional, democratic, and overthrow an elected government. Now, unfortunately, this was also an Obama-Biden tactic. Let's consider Victoria Nuland appointment. It was Nuland who bragged that five billion US dollars to an engineer a US coup in the Ukraine was money well spent. Bragged this, this was the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy. This is Biden's choice for a new Secretary, Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. And it immediately signals that relations with Russia and China will get worse while the NATO military alliance will be reinforced. Military spending and subversion spending through NED funding will increase. I raise it because we need to be so aware that US wars do come home Wars come home in the lack of cooperation for testing, the lack of cooperation on a vaccine. Wars come home in endless money for militarism, 800 military bases around the world, and yet we have no public health system. Wars come home in enormous internal repressive apparatus, the police, the prisons, largest prison population in the world, no social infrastructure. 
Wars come home in a banking infrastructure that's able to track loans and deeds back a hundred years, but they can't track a virus with mass testing. There's no social infrastructure in the US today, and we are paying the cost in hundreds of thousands of deaths. Now, I do certainly acknowledge that the end of the Trump administration is a relief from open misogyny and racism. What an enormous, enormous step. But we have to know that Biden promised again and again throughout the election cycle that he stood for no substantial change. A, div a, di a div diverse cabinet, yes, but what we need is real, substantial, fundamental change, literally in order to survive, because no substantial change is killing us. No substantial change is killing the planet. Now, I work in the sanctions kill campaign, sanctions against 39 uh, countries, a third of the world population. It's a crime against humanity but it's a silent killer. Overwhelmingly, no one even knows it exists. In a time of COVID, the sanctions come right back, starving countries down, denying trade and resources and medical supplies, even food, it comes back and hits us here. COVID and so many other controllable diseases impact us here. Life expectancy in the US is actually in decline. U.S. wars come home. They always do. I work with the United National Anti-War Coalition. And again and again, we say, explain that U.S. wars are the greatest theft of human resources. It's wars at home and abroad. We need collective action to resist all the wars and constant war propaganda because it's that propaganda that poisons and and just seeps down into our movements. The racist arrogance, it infects our movements. I work with the Workers' Assembly Against Racism. We're planning an action here in New York City on inauguration day, next Wednesday, to say workers' demands from day one. I'm part of the Veterans for Peace China Working Group. It's a valuable resource. How do we explain the issues that are going on right now and combat the propaganda. Now, I edited a just released book, Capitalism on a Ventilator, The Impact of COVID-19 in China and the US. And its purpose was to confront the anti-China racism and China bashing, the trade wars, the military encirclement by gathering, there's 55 chapters by social justice activists and each of them are asking fundamental questions. How is it the US has almost as many deaths a day, every day, as China has in total over the course of a year? It's stunning. We have the highest infection rate, the highest death rate in the world. Supposedly, we're the richest country. In multi-billionaires, that is. So let's combat this poisonous climate of fear, of racist arrogance. And to do that, we need facts, we need talking points, we need political mobilization. We need to be raising demands for what we need from PPE to vaccines. Let's also be asking why socialist countries with national planning and social mobilization, such as in China, in Cuba, in Vietnam, are able to at least contain and control this deadly virus. There's a global crisis unfolding. It's happening in real time. And the United States has utterly failed to protect its own population and has ignored and made conditions far worse for most of the world. So, in closing, I wanna say that we live in an inherently unstable system. Capitalism has unpreventable cyclical crises every seven to 10 years for more than 300 years. 
It's inevitable, it's incurable, it's systematic. Capitalism needs racism, sexism, the ugliest forms of bigotry in order to function the working class in this system has to be kept divided. The system needs racist police and it uses fascist forces again and again. So it's 99 hours to a new administration. Let's think of the period ahead as a time to make people's demands. It's 99 hours, yes. But I challenge you, it is 100 days from inauguration day to May Day. That's a workers' day around the world, a day of united struggles, a day that in the US lifted up migrant struggles. It's a global day. So in the next 100 days, let's set a goal. Let's see this as a time to challenge, to fight for our lives and for our future. As Strong Buffalo said in opening, where we go, we go together. Thank you. Sarah, why don't you also speak on that a little bit and just in a, in a nutshell, and I mean a nutshell, tell okay. us about the sanctions. Why is that so harmful for us to sanction other countries? Well, well let me first um, address what was known uh, because to, to say that I don't think there was a breakdown in communication. I think every different Congress and Senate person questioned the Capitol Police and other police units beforehand. Um, so whether we say it's inept or they're unable uh, or they were openly in collusion. And I think that is a real possibility when you're talking about using police agencies against fascist forces. They want the fascist forces to at least succeed or have a chance to make their message clear. And in the same way that they understand deeply the role of sanctions. It's a surprise to people of the world, and especially people here, that often see sanctions as an alternative to war, that sanctions are the most brutal and deadly form of war. That when you starve down a whole country, when it's at a cost of tens and tens of thousands of lives, when you leave the grocery stores and the medicine shelves empty, and a country can't get spare parts, can't get batteries, doesn't have an x-ray machine. This is the way the US now fights wars and they do it consciously. And it's also silent for the population here, unless we speak out, unless we set every alarm yeah. bill. So I'll, I'll just say that. Um, because he's gonna speak in just a minute. No, he's not. Two minutes. All right, all right, I guess somebody else is uh, coming in there, but uh, just, uh, just to say that we, we, gotta, we gotta like really scream and yell that sanctions are war and NED programs around the world are war, are war. And uh, the Capitol Police supposedly being asleep, that's fascist collaboration. Let's call things by their name and we'll be much clearer on what we need to do.